Yeah, I'll do it. Cool. Hello, everybody. How's it going? What's up, peeps? I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are the Goslings. Yes, sir. And we have something very exciting today. But oh, first, we'll... yes. yeah. Oh, it's going to get good. It's going to get real good. It's going to get apocalyptic up in here. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start us off with our toast today, and then we will enter. We will uh, introduce our our guest. Good. Take up the broken sword of your father and strike down the darkness. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Is that bullet again? Uh, no, actually, it's... Uh, no, it's a little smoother and lighter than bullet. It's uh, Gentleman Jack. Really? Yeah. Yeah, no mictors or bullet today because inflation. Oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but... Uh, slumming it with some yes. Gentleman Jack. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, That's whatever. Right. I didn't pay for it, so it's good. <laughs> you know. Uh, it's, so, it's so yummy. Well, yeah. do you want to uh, introduce our guest? Yeah, we have the the sultan of the esoteric, <laughs> the the king of Christian arcane mythology, the revealer of the dragon court, the the master of the Genesis six conspiracy, author of the Genesis six conspiracy, and the Illuminati's worst nightmare, and the Illuminati's worst nightmare, yep. baby. Yep, the man, the myth. The legend, the great Gary Wayne. Hello, Gary. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for inviting me back. And uh, I don't think I could ever live up to the introductions that you guys give for me. It's like <laughs> you've earned them all already. Yeah. <laughs> we are so glad to have you back. I think this is our fourth interview with you. So, yeah. And every time we talk to you, we learn so much. I know that the people watch you uh, just really enjoy it and they learn just yeah. so much. And uh, excited to jump back in with you. Um, first, uh, we have, like we talked about, we have, you know, a, a bunch of different questions. Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, we wanted to kind of jump right into this and ask you about the, 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 the roots of Freemasonry in the architecture of uh, Washington, D.C., and what could be possibly uh, some of the ties to the uh, pre-flood times and that 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 uh, yeah, original sacred knowledge? Sort of a link, you know, between, you know, the Illuminati architecture that we know in Fest DC. Does any of that have any traces back to in your mind or your estimation to like pre-flood Nephilim architecture or uh, technology? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And the answer of course is yes it does um and it's actually rather profound and you know from a sort of a nerd sort of perspective it's rather almost diabolical in terms of genius in terms of what they've done in the city of washington and you could probably do a complete show just on all the occult things that were done in Washington. So hmm. I'll just sort of set the table for people that I know a lot of the audience will already know before we get into more stuff that they don't maybe don't know. So Washington wasn't a city before the revolution, right? They actually built the city. They chose the location and I think they probably went through a number of locations that they would build this city because this is going to be sort of the beacon on the hill it's going to be the new city of light the new camelot which is just absolutely filled with the imagery of sodom and gomorrah which they would view as their cities on a hill uh, and cities of light and cities of the nephilim it would have to have significant for the location for what they were plotting as the Templar dream to create America to be the launching pad for world government and universal religion, to be the place that they're going to be created, would have to have a significantly uh, important location if you're going to put your center of that new empire that you're going to funnel your efforts into to, to create and then create a sort of an organizational structure that at that time the sort of envision might 
be what world government might look at as all these independent states with one central government and one central religion. The new Babylon as the Templars were looking to institute. And so it would have significant astrological alignments, mm. astronomical alignments, and in accordance to ley lines, not yeah. only as they sort of go about the earth, but as they intersect with other ley lines around the world, right? Would have to have all of that. And I think they might've had a few choices with that, but they also wanted a location that would be sort of central to the 13 colonies from the north and the south. Or maybe that was just a coincidence that it sort of worked out that way, but it also had to be farther, far enough away from New York City, which was probably going to be occupied by the British, which they ended up doing. And they wanted to make sure that, you know, they weren't, they're more decentralized in the revolution, I think, and then centralized in a place that would be uh, a place that they might more easily protect. Um, although it was assaulted in 1812 as well, but not not as easily, I don't think, as, as what New York was, was taken. So they would have put a lot of thought into it, and they chose this location. Yeah. And so that starts to make sense of what else they did there. So it's in, it, you know, when you have the ability to lay the streets out any way that you want, pick any location that you want, and then you see all the peculiar angles of the streets that are in Washington proper, the original city, then you start to say, well, why would that be? Were they that disorganized? No, these were the most learned people in America. They had the knowledge of the ancients mm -hmm. they, in terms of the secret society. So they built their angles to represent geometric shapes and particularly triangles and pyramids and as they would intersect in terms of pentagrams. And that's sort of the, the start of how they were going to run it. And then they would they picked certain locations where they were going to have the White House, the House of Congress and everything else that would fit into those at sacred geometry, that sacred astrological and astronomical alignments and the ley lines. And then they built architecture that represented the pantheon of the gods that they were representing. So they mm. used the like the White House and the dome ceilings, like the Pan yeah. uh, Temple at Mount Hermon. They bring in an, an yeah. Egyptian obelisk. obelisk. They, they have, you know, in the dome, they have the apotheosis of George Washington, which is yep. that ancient sort of representation of after the Raphaim die, they get raised to be demigods or gods, you know, yeah. that in, in, in heaven or looking down. And so all the thought process was there to honor their pantheon of gods and present in taciturn communication who they were and what they were planning to do to bring in the new Atlantis for the end time. Francis Bacon's new Atlantis, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and there's that fertility ritual thing going on with, uh, what is it? The reflecting pool and the obelisk and then the capital. Yeah, um, it, the, yeah the Egyptian, um, I think, what is it? The phallus of Osiris? Am I remembering yep. that correctly? Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and, and it gives you sort of this reflection that is as on earth, you know, so in heaven or on as, as heaven, so below, however that you want oh, to do so it. Oh, yeah. And then there, then, then there would be a lot of rituals that would be associated in the occult, which there are uh, with the water and the pools and things like oh, that. Cool. Yeah. And the water would also <laughs> represent, you know, the gods of the sea, which play prevalently, particularly in yeah. the Atlantean mythos with Poseidon. Like there's just layer upon layer upon layer yeah. of things that people don't recognize whatsoever it, it is absolutely astonishing what they've done in in washington to um show the praise for the the gods of who they who they worship and whom they base the seven sacred sciences and the extra knowledge that develops that science on the gods right they are they were the knowledge cult and so they're going to honor that pantheon of gods that's also represented in the wandering stars. 
right? So again, you create that pyramid that they have of of the wandering stars in terms of uh, it's and and the wandering stars has not only antediluvian gods, but it has offspring gods that that rise up afterwards as well. So you get not only in in Washington, but in the education centers, as we've probably talked about in the past, you get architecture that is Roman, you get architecture that is Greek, you get architecture that is Egyptian, and you get architecture that is Babylonian, because they're paying homage to their um, beast empires that came before, which relates back to the concept that this is the platform for the end time empire that rises out mm. of the ashes of the Roman Empire, which comes out of all the other empires. But the knowledge is antediluvian. The knowledge is the knowledge that built the pyramids, that built the great cities that we can't account for. It's the time of the development of those sciences and the illicit knowledge. And so all of it is to do like a renaissance of that mm -hmm. and so you had a parallel revolution that was kind of going on at paris as well that happened shortly after with the french revolution and they're going to do similar things and de-christianize paris right after for you know a short period of time but they're setting up that cult of reason and they have the exact same imagery that is going mm -hmm. on in washington as they do in in paris france at that time and this is just to bring back those ancient capitals that were um, so it's like a reincarnation sort of thing, of, so to speak, of all of the ancient capitals of the great empires past that worship the same religion as they did. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Did is there a how did they pick that particular spot? on the map for Washington. Was there something special about those the particular intersection of ley lines? Coordinates? Yeah. The intersection of ley lines and ancient uh, First American or First Nations um, religious sites. So because typically you build upon the ancient sites. So one one should look more into who you know was living there before in terms of the First Nations and they probably chose um, areas, you know, you know, that were sacred to to the local tribes. I don't. I haven't done any research on that, but that would be my speculation because that's the mo. Yeah. Well, it is the mo because um, the uh, the Giza necropolis, like Graham Hancock talked about in Fingerprints of the Gods, you know, from a, a top down person, an aerial view, mm -hmm. the Giza necropolis has not just the Sphinx with its water erosion, but also uh, the pyramids, the three pyramids, which sort of mirror the um, the belt of a uh, Orion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, this is like a tried and true, yeah. you know. Well, and another thing to check out, and I, and I believe I did, I can't quite remember, but it might be also good to sort of check out what is the uh, latitude of Washington City. If somebody Googles that, mm -hmm. I bet you might find something uh, correlating there as well. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, um, I was, uh, as I was getting ready for the interview and I was thinking about, well, I was, I, I read, uh, the, the, there's like two really solid chapters in here about, uh, Freemasonry. Yeah. Uh, and I, as I was doing some searches online, I discovered that before we had, right now we're like on the Greenwich, the Greenwich Meridian basically determines where zero longitude is. Oh yeah. Right. That was established in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. 200 years before that meridian, it was called the Paris Meridian, and it's actually farther to the east, really? Paris Meridian. And what's interesting about that is that if you use the Paris Meridian for zero, yeah. and you go 33 degrees north and 33 degrees east, that puts you at the summit of Mount Hermon. No way. Yeah. 33 30 degrees, degrees, baby. Yeah. yeah. 33 degrees. Which it, yeah, which is the current 33, 33, 33rd degree latitude. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So they they basically reverse engineer it and flip it and say, okay, this is where we need to be in order to honor this yeah, sort maybe. of thing. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Dude. That's yeah. crazy. That is awesome. That is crazy. Yeah, we could talk for an hour on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Nick, you, uh, you had another really good question uh, that kind of, all of this ties yeah. together, but this sort of ties into it about um, uh, cult of Saturn. Yeah, the cult of Saturn too. Uh, Saturn is uh, you know Saturn, Kronos, and he's named by you know other names throughout history as well. Uh, but it, it it seems like Derek Gilbert wrote uh, a book called The Second Coming of Saturn. And I've been reading through that recently as well, and it seems like there's a lot uh, in DC 
there's a lot of imagery uh, that would denote that a second return of this particular God is going to happen. And this particular God, I'm, I get confused because when I think Saturn I, and I'm reading through your book and others, it seems like Saturn is this Luciferian figure, but it's, but at the same time, I get other, uh, I, I get other inclinations that Saturn may have been one of the angels that, that sinned and has been locked away in the abyss. What are your thoughts on that? Who is Saturn? Is he Lucifer? Is he not Lucifer? It, what do you, well, what I do think- you I think I think it's a really good question. So uh, the first thought is a lot of people, you know, like Anki would say that would be a representative of of Satan on Earth. Except that Anki's not at the top of the pantheon, right? Yeah, uh, he kind of shares things, and so Satan would be sort of over above. So when you look at Saturn, um, that is representative of a very important god in the seven wandering stars. And it's Kronos, as you were saying. And Saturn in Rome is the god for Kronos, uh, also known as Jeb in Egypt and Anu in Samaria, which is the parent god of Anki. He's an offspring god, Anki is. And El in Canaan. And there's more because they all have these parent gods, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting, though, is is that all of these gods also have um, sort of consorts or wives as well as parents and as with the offspring. And in some accounts, you have with the Leviathan sort of comparison, you have like Tiamat as being the female in Samaria, uh, which isn't a consort of Anu, but is Apsu. Uh, but in a lot of sort of al- allegorical sort of approaches, you kind of look at, well, there's two Leviathans and is Satan kind of like that serpent like Leviathan? And you have maybe the female that's killed in the beginning. And we know the male is going to be dealt with in, in the end time, according to the book of Isaiah. So a lot of people would maybe sort of connect that into Satan as well. But that's not the same gods as Saturn, right? It's a different one. So it gets a little bit sort of complex on that. And I think these are when you have like Saturn as the sun god, which he's typically also represented as, and the chief god, whether or not it's before or after the flood. And what I mean by that is Zeus or Osiris would be like synonymous with being a sun god, and they're the offspring gods. And so the head god of the original pantheon before the flood with the parent gods would also be representative of a sun god. So I, I'm thinking that that is an allegory for the chief god as well. And that's what Freemasonry believes, is all of those are allegories for Halel or Lucifer, the great architect of, of, of the universe. So I don't think that that actually ref- represents satan directly but it it's they're operating on on his behalf and below him just as satan would sit above the council of the gods mm-hmm. so who would be the chief sort of patriarch from a biblical perspective or an enochian perspective i would probably look to saturn being maybe more um equated with azazel which is one of the satans mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as, as being that sort of chief. But having said that, once we start to look at how the people worship these wandering stars, um, and, it's, and by the way, they're, they're you know, essentially represented in the seven days of the week as well in the solar mm-hmm. year, as opposed to the lunar calendar, which would have been what the descendants of Seth were following and what the Israelites followed Mm -hmm. and that you have this sun worshiping cult that's developed by Enoch son of Cain um, that is going to develop the seven sciences that includes the astronomy and the astrology that's going to track the procession of the sun through the zodiac. Um, You start to make a few more connections here that what's being worshipped is these pantheon of gods and satan is sort of set above that and i think that's reflected after Mm. the destruction of babylon in the end time at the midpoint of the last seven years where satan 
and Antichrist are going to be worshipped, right? And it's a new religion that Daniel talks about in Daniel 11 that their forefathers didn't know. So I think you get a destruction of this old Babylon religion replaced with this this Saturn Satan religion, if we can elevate it to that level, uh, coming down and being honored in a way that he ha wasn't honored in the past because it's the pantheon both before and after the flood that was being worshipped. They're the ones that were walking amongst humankind and mating with them. So we need to understand that sort of um, um, distinction. And so if we understand that, but it's still really part of the satanic religion, right? But yeah. it's just, there's there's two pieces to it, two layers to it. And the third layer with, with the offspring gods, but it's the same structure. So... The cult of Satan, as we understand, or the cult of Saturn, as we understand it today, and I have no idea what other people, you know, have researched on this, but uh, you know, it's a it's a really sort of interesting topic, is an Indo-Aryan cult, which means antediluvian, right? It's the original Nephilim cult. It's that Enochian mysticism that was the black magic at Atlantis. It's the same sun worshiping, astrological, polytheist religion, and it was. And it's sort of defined as the age of Saturn and the cult of Saturn was the birth and the destruction of the golden age, which is antediluvian. Oh, wow. Right. And it's and it's also described by the ancient authors as um, the time where, again, you had this golden age that's described in the book of Hesiod. And that's the one that they reference. So it's the age of the heroes. It's the age of the parent gods. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to produce the offspring gods as well, how, whether or not they're just lower in, in, the, in the host of the rebellious army or they're actually created. That's probably allegory because I, I don't think they probably, I don't think they created gods. I think yeah. they're, you know, I think they created demigods. Mm -hmm. They probably, mm -hmm. they may be able to create, you know, a lower set of gods by taking a physical body and copulating with each other. But there seemingly was no need to do that because they wouldn't have the same sort of capability as the parent gods. They'd be a product of the physical world, right? As opposed yeah. to being a product of the uh, spiritual world. And so it would be hard to imagine how they could overthrow the parent gods. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think yeah. they actually do. I think the parent gods go to the abyss for the crimes that they yeah. did against humanity for in crimes against um, creation and which would include the creation of the Nephilim. And then I think the offspring gods did the same thing again. And they also went to the abyss, which is why they no longer yeah. walk amongst us after the flood. So this is, this is the, uh, the time of the, the the reigning of Saturn, which is the god of time, as they like to call it in the antediluvian mm -hmm. epoch. Mm -hmm. And this is very much a religion that is taken to heart by the Etruscans and then passed on to the Romans. And mm -hmm. so when you get the creation of Rome, you get the seven hills of Rome, right? Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right? And We're those are together. the... Yeah, the Palatine Hill, the Abertine Hill, the uh, Calian Hill, the Capuline Hill, the Esquiline Hill, the Quirinal Hill, and the Verminal uh, Hill. Seven hills, the seven mountains, right, of Rome. Uh, Vatican Hill would be outside the original walls of Rome, but in around 800 AD or so, or maybe a little bit before, it was uh, set inside the walls of Rome. And it's a sister city to the Palant sister hill to the Palatine Hill. But you had a temple to Saturn originally, and then a temple to Jupiter, his son, so the equivalent to Zeus mm -hmm. in the in the Greek pantheon at the uh, Capuline Hill. And what's interesting about the Capuline Hill is that's the Latin word that you get capital or capital yep. city from. Oh, right. right. Yep. Okay. That's right. where you get the yeah. word. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so this is in the city of Rome. And it's also, you know, the festival of Saturnia went from yep. December 17th to the 23rd, <clears throat> followed by the birth date of uh, Mithra, 
December 25, followed yep. by Sol Invictus. So uh, you get a whole sort of surrounding of that sort of uh, ancient Zoroastrian or Indo-Aryan religion mm -hmm. that is going to be homogenized into Christianity with, with Constantine. But that's a, that's a separate sort of whole. And so what's interesting uh, about that is as you have with the seven hills of rome that seems to be what is being depicted for end time babylon yeah yeah right yeah. It's because the seven hills are seven mountains or hills mm -hmm. and also seven kings not either or they're both right. yeah and we have to understand that and the seven kings are the seven empires who had this mystical religion, and those are the beast empires, just as the end time beast empire will have Babylon, that religion who's going to sit on seven mountains. And Babylon, as you take that back to Greek in the New Testament, where it's used in the book of Peter and in, in Revelation, not only does it mean, as you take that back to its Hebrew word, um, it's the source word for Babylon, so it represents, you know, that as sort of the imagery of the of one of the beast empires and its religion that it's really famous for, because that's the religion of Nimrod mm -hmm. uh, from oh, Babel, yes. which is mm -hmm. the source word for Babylon. Mm -hmm. And so this is that original post-Diluvian religion yeah. that is restarted after the flood. That was the original Enochian mysticism mm -hmm. that is being sort of idolized in washington city <laughs> that we just yeah. talked about right and yeah. it would be the same way wherever that you go on it and so palatine hill is the home of the queen of heaven oh and, and hmm. as you know and they all have a queen of heaven but in the roman pantheon it was the queen of heaven was in sibylline prophecies and that Vatican Hill would be a branch of the Palatine Hill. So I would look for the current Roman Catholic religion that sort of sort of melds into this universal religion. But I would expect its home center on the seven mountains to be in within the original walls of Rome on either Palatine Hill or on um, hmm. Capuline Hill. And, yeah. you know would be the center for babylon of the end time and so now you can take all the other pieces of information that you have about the cult of saturn and just sort of say okay that sort of brings it together and we can start to move it to a place where it starts to make some sense and we understand that as babylon because that's the seven wandering stars that the bible tells us that they were worshiping so yeah it all ties together seven wandering stars seven hills yeah you got it everything yeah. is representative yeah. of that and we know it's not jerusalem right because yeah. antichrist will move his religious center to jerusalem after the destruction of babylon and we know babylon is a city because it's said it's a city like i think nine times in the book of revelation and it's also a universal religion and it's also a economic system and it's also a geo geopolitical system that controls mm -hmm. the ten kings which is why they hand their power over to antichrist to destroy babylon yeah. so i don't know what other people say about um, the cult of saturn but that's kind of my research in terms of how it interconnects Gosh, that's awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. Do you, you know, with the, with the cult of, actually, with the seven hills of, of Rome, and Rome, you know, projected to be the new Babylon, uh, going back to our conversation about Washington, DC, Washington, DC, and how it's uniquely laid out, is there anything in its design that is attributed to it or, or as a homage to Rome? Not, not specifically that I can tell, but uh, you know, I would, I would expect that they've layered it in, but not that I've detected that I can specifically, you know, take back to, to Rome. But, but you know, when you have that dome, temple though, right, mm -hmm. that that I talked about in reference to Pan, you yeah. also have that temple of Jupiter that was that dome temple. And, and that could yeah. be that homage that that you're looking for 
Yeah. Yeah. On on uh, the hill. What, what was it called? Cap Capuline. What Capuline Hill? Capuline. Yeah. And also you have, and they might even be the same. I'd have to double check um, my history on it. But you had the uh, Temple of the Pantheon as well, which is a oh. was a huge dome. Yeah. Uh, temple as well. And has that Oculus in the middle of it, yeah. that opening, that oh, hole. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And our, our, you know, capital, our capital building, we call it Capitol Hill. Oh, yeah. yeah. Capitol Hill. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 Gotta and pay it's you know, homage to the, yeah, yeah. to the legacy of your beast empire. King, you king of the pagan gods. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> crazy. The more, the more one understands prehistory and the words that were used and the things yeah. that were made, you can start to peel back the onion on everything that's done. Yes. In well, terms that's what of makes... the architecture. Yes, and that's what makes the Genesis 6 conspiracy so great. We've talked about this in the past, but, you know, your your attention to prophecy is what led you to, you know, biblical prehistory and this 30 year magnus opus that is the Genesis 6 conspiracy Mm -hmm. is sort of, you know, sometimes people will ask, you know, well, like, well, it seems like, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, like Rob Skiba talks about this is like, you know, this stuff kind of seems like it's empty calorie theology or discussion it's like no it's not because as you so you know consistently point out if you want to understand where you're going you have to understand the the prehistory of the bible and so all of these things that seem odd the architecture of dc the you know the end times you know babylonian leviathan you know the beast system it all has precedent back here you know and the genesis 6 conspiracy and that's what makes it important yeah, it's it's so important to understand what they're doing so you're not deceived, right? Right. And and I yeah. get also asked a lot of times, do you believe what they say? And mm-hmm. my standard answer is that it's not important whether I believe what they're saying or whether I believe it's all accurate what they're saying. What's Good. important is is that they believe it. Right. And what they're doing with that belief in that information. Right. Yeah, it's like the it's like the Illuminati in the music industry. You see you see a lot of breakdown videos, you know, on uh, on YouTube, especially with the hip hop industry, mm-hmm. you know. But it's it's replete. It's everywhere. And um and it's that same thing. It's like does it matter if it's, you know, real or not or whether you believe it or not? Well, yes, but what really kind of matters is the fact that they believe it. Yeah. And it's it's vital yeah. to them. Therefore, it's going to manifest in ways that whether or not they are under a delusion or whether or not they're really in, you know, the consort with, Mm. you know, in league with the devil. Yeah. Like that's how it manifests. You know, I I have have a quick question for you, Gary. Um, In light of how Washington was designed, you know, by Freemasons with all of this attributed to these pagan gods and all of that connection to prehistory, uh, do you ever cringe when someone says that America is uh, a Christian nation founded on yeah. Christian principles? <laughs> As a Canadian. What do you think when you hear that? <laughs> I, do. I mean, you guys did burn cringe. the White House I down do. in 1812, so good for you. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you made an attempt to save us from ourselves, Gary. <laughs> uh, yes. Now, that was more the British, though, but it was a war of with Canada yeah. as well at the time. But um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I do. I do to a certain degree. And I, I don't with, you know, sort of disrespect to people who uh, look at what the Constitution and, and, and the nation did. Um, but we need to sort of look through the lens of what the founders were actually trying to do. They weren't necessarily trying to protect the rights and worship of Christians. Right. They were looking to protect their right to worship as they chose without persecution from the Vatican or the Roman church or anybody else or any king or president or governor that would come along, right? They wanted protection that they could practice their religion without vatican oversight which is why Mm. you had that stigma of the vatican influence all you know you know you couldn't have a a catholic president for for so many years it was sort of that sort of biases that that went into it based the constitution although it has benefited 
for most of its period of time, Christians in terms of the ability to worship was always, in my opinion, um, based on the motivation of the writers was to only protect the polytheists and it could protect Christians until they were ready to turn it against Christians in a way that would lead to, you know, the genocides that are coming in the end time. And we've seen that swing away in the last 40 or 50 years oh, that yeah. what's written in the Bible is hate speech. What Christians right. believe is racist, hateful, mm -hmm. bigoted. And bigoted. And year by year, they're upgrading that to a level of isolating mm -hmm. a people uh, and a belief system that they can eliminate them from the face of the earth at will because they're just they're just wor not worthy to be in this age that they're going to be building, which is that new life. age of Atlantis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that they're too mundane and they're not able to vibrate and evolve into God. And, they're, they're just, and we're regressive and yeah, yes. we'll never transcend. And the only way to be a Christian is through theosophy and Christ consciousness and yes. all of these oh, we're gonna new age bastardizations of, you know, yeah, but we're gonna, we're gonna if I look at mountain of brass, <laughs> if I look at if, if I look at the positive side of the Constitution in the U.S. is all the other constitutions around the world that followed afterwards are based on the American Constitution. Yeah. And so, you know, the world sort of uh, benefited on that. But it's not as strongly written or built like the American Constitution is because as we learned in the last few years in Canada is, is our constitution doesn't give us rights. It only gives us privileges that they can mm. take away mm. anytime Whatever. they want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the constitution, you know, only they pay lip service to it, you know, and that's always the big fight between, uh, with a lot of my fellow, like really conservative or libertarian sort of off the grid Christian friends that's always the, the struggle. The internal struggle is like on the surface, it seems like we're a Christian nation, you know, but but we're really founded off of, you know, this Nephilim ideology, mm. you know, um, French Enlightenment, you know, uh, Age of Reason, Francis Bacon, New Atlantis kind of um, uh, mentality and pursuit, you know, and so it's like, man, are we? You know, are we a Christian nation, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all? And what does that mean? Or are we Leviathan? You know, mm -hmm. it's really tough, man. As a patriot, as a lover of the country, as a Southerner, you know, as yeah. a Christian, it's a real fight that we have yeah. a lot of times internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and I know, you know, the, the phrase in God we trust has been sort of um, accepted you know, widely that that's referring to the God of the Bible, right? Sure, but oh no. But is it really? Not. Because right. in polytheism, you know, they tend to pay homage to their genealogies mm -hmm. back to a specific fallen angel. Right. Um, and or yeah. you could take that back to the head of the pantheon that ruled Mount Hermon after the flood that, again, you know, the, the royal families would... Uh, you know, take their genealogies back to the Raphaim and the particular their angel that produced them. But Baal was the head of the pantheon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, and that's mm. the coded language that they use. What does God yeah. mean? Is it is it that or if you listen to other conspiracy theorists, they'll say, well, it's the you know, it's the guns, oil and drugs, you know, yeah. the, the, the illicit commerce that goes on, you know, and yeah. banana republics, you mm -hmm. know, and the Marines enforcing that just there's so much there. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And then if you think about it in terms of that, we're not. And again, I know this is kind of sacred ground for American patriotism, mm -hmm. but you know, in the Bible, we're told not to swear oaths, right? But yet, there's That's an a oath real of fight. allegiance to this constitution, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good point. It, I struggled with it when, um, uh, ultimately it didn't work out, and I think it was God's uh intervention, but I tried really hard for a few years to get into the Marines. Uh, I tried until I was too old, actually. And uh, and I remember thinking that at one point that like, ah, you know, I got to swear an oath, but and it's a it seems like it's a good oath. That's yeah. the like enticing nature of the Luciferian game that gets played. Is that like, 
it doesn't sound like it's a bad oath, you know? I mean, it, it really is. And I know so many great men who, you know, are veterans who swore yeah. the oath well, and really believe, but you're told not to swear an oath. And if you swear an oath, and it doesn't matter what the sort of softening up of it is as well, but you, just because you swear an oath doesn't mean you should do anything illegal. But what God says is, is if you swear a whole oath, you're to uphold that oath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, Right. And you will be yeah. held accountable for that. Yes. Oath. Mm -hmm. You know, that actually played out really well in one of my favorite dorky movies of all time that I love. The Man in the Iron Mask. Mm -hmm. That was actually like a sort of a character arc of D'Artagnan in that movie. Yep. And they actually have that argument because he's protecting the king played by Leonardo DiCaprio, who's this, you know, brat. You know, and and because <laughs> yep. it's Leo and uh, well cast, know, yeah, well cast. And Gabriel Byrne plays uh, D'Artagnan, and he's awesome in it. And he says, you know, I swore an oath. Right. You know, and one of the other musketeers tells him, you know, well, when the king betrays his country, you're no longer beholden to your oath. And he says that very line of like, well, an oath is an oath simply because it cannot be betrayed mm. or broken. Yep. And it's yep. that dichotomy. Of it's almost like a covenant. It's almost yeah. like a yep. covenant. Yeah, and I, and I also think there's a spirit though. If you're if you're sort of in spirit and the right spirit that you're swearing an oath to God, yeah, okay, that's good, right? Yeah. That's who your intent is, but yeah. that's not how the spirit's forces are going to use it against you. It's, it would be right. uh, the other way. But uh, also understand that God will hold you accountable for that as well. So, yeah. Well, and it you better happens. fulfill it. Yeah. Yeah. In that movie. Uh, and that's actually why I mentioned that D'Artagnan ends up uh, dying for his oath in yeah. that movie. And it's a it's very sweet. It's very, you know, bittersweet and tragic. But yeah, you know, it's almost as if God only wants you swearing an oath to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And, and everything else is maybe not worth yeah. your soul. And, mm. and, and God can trump any oath that he chooses and we know that sure. he can he doesn't always do it it might be actually more rare but i think biblically we do get an example of god canceling one of the oaths and for me it's you know it's because you understand what is going on in the secret societies and the mystical religion that you understand the moses story a lot better where you have satan after moses dies yeah. is there to claim the body and well, what right does, him. yeah but what right does he have and 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 why is michael there fighting him well if you think about moses's story he is adopted into the royal family and mm -hmm. if you understand what we've talked about in the past that you are raised as a royal bloodline into the mysteries right from childhood you become an adept before yeah. you're an adult okay. and he would have been educated and raised up at Heliopolis and sworn those oaths to the pantheon, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, before God reclaims him in terms of where I'm going to, you know, now utilize you for my my purposes because that's why I put you there. And it also enabled Moses to talk to the Egyptians when he comes back in their own language. And in a way, oh, they understood yeah. would be no misunderstandings what he was telling them because. Mm -hmm. He, he understood everything about their religion and their language and countered it with that and then with the force of God and for good. But when he dies, Satan's there to claim his legal right to Moses. But in this case, God trumps that yeah. mm. and sends Michael. Um, so he can do it, but... I wouldn't advise swearing those oaths that may get you into a situation where it's not yeah. going to be trumped. You could even say that Michael God... might not come to save you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. You, you could say that God trumped that, uh, you, uh, the devil's legal right with Enoch as well, because he walked with God right. and was no more. And Elijah, who was taken up. Yeah. You know, all mankind is appointed to die. It's funny how God is God, such a benevolent father. Our dad was a lot like this, how he would yep. break his own rules out of charity and mercy and kindness yep. and grace and, yep. you know, and love, you know, he doesn't yep. ever betray his own rules to the detriment of his children. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That'll preach. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> well, good. And, 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 and I do think that, I love it. That's, that's also one of the things that Jesus it's taught. It's cool. not just the legal aspect of the law. It's the spirit of the law too, right? So. Mm -hmm. The spirit of the law, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, well, okay. that, that ties into your question about uh, the plagues. 
Oh, the plagues of Egypt. Yeah. Um, actually, if, that if you was, want, if you want, that was one of Nick's questions. Um, but it's a good one. Uh, you know, we were interested in the nature of the angel of the Lord, um, and whether or not the angel of the Lord is a manifestation of uh, of the Trinity, and specifically. I don't know if this ties in together or if these are two separate questions, Gary, so I apologize. But we were really interested in um, the part where when it comes to the last plague of Egypt, um, God says that he's going to basically do it himself as opposed to sending somebody else. So yep. does he send the angel of the Lord? Is that a manifestation of himself? Yep. And is there a reason why he sends himself in that final plague? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it's Lord God, so you get both terms Yahweh oh, yeah, Elohim right. there, right? So yeah. So there's which, no mistake who we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so it's very, very important. And the angel of the Lord is the one in the burning bush, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also the angel of the Lord, he blesses Abraham. It's the one that appears to Abraham. Yeah. 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 Right. And uh I think he also blesses uh, Jacob as well. Oh, uh, yeah. And you have two terms with the angel of the Lord. You have that and you have the angel of God, right? That's uh, used okay. in Ezekiel or Ezekiel Exodus 14, 19, that it is the angel of God that is going to stand in the cloud and separates Israel from the attacking um, Egyptians. And then mm -hmm. that's going to be the angel that is going to lead Israel in the time of the Exodus as well. And so we oh, get, fire. yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I, mm -hmm. when I referred to the angel of the Lord blessing Abraham, I was kind of more or less referring to uh, Melchizedek. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because in the book of Hebrews, he has no genealogy. He has no mother. Right. He has yes. no father. He has no beginning and no end. The mystery of Melchizedek. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah. it is perfect that a pre-flesh word would manifest himself just as he did when he went with two other angels to Abraham just before the Sodom event, mm -hmm. right? So we know yeah. he does that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. Would bless Abraham because yeah. that's going to be the nation that is the nation of hope that's going to produce the tribe of Judah that's going to bring Jesus as you know being the word made flesh into this world to do the first part of his commission as a resolution to the angelic rebellion mm -hmm. that's why Adamites have been created we're the resolution right and so you have it proper that the word would bless Abraham, just as I think he blesses Jacob. Uh, and so you have, with this angel of the Lord then, you have him, and it doesn't say angel of the Lord in the last plague, which is the death of the firstborn, right? It just says the Lord. Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't say Lord God there. Or does it? I can't remember. I, I think it's just the Lord. But... Um, but anyways, he is going on the first Passover to mm -hmm. do this plague of the firstborn. Mm -hmm. Just as Israel is talked about as the firstborn of God in an allegorical sense, of course he's not, that would be the word as Proverbs talks about. Um, and that this is the prophetic feast of his crucifixion for his mission that's going to be coming along. Mm -hmm. And it's extracting a price, I think, from the beast kingdoms. And this is the first beast kingdom because Israel is being raised into a nation in, in mm. Egypt for the sacrifice of God's firstborn at yeah. mm -hmm. Cal Calvary. So I think there's all of that 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 is going on. And he's the Lord of the Passover, right? He's the Lord mm -hmm. of the first Passover. And that this is going to be commemorated as part of the Feast of the Weeks, which is all prophetic. I mean, of all of the feasts that are in the Feast of the Lord, not just Passover and Unleavened Bread, but 
all of them, whether it's the tabernacles or day of atonement, they're all prophetic, right? Yeah. And for what's going to take place. And that this is, this is sort of the start of Israel's commission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it starts to begin and he protects his people with, with the blood of the lamb, which he's going to become yeah. the lamb of God at the crucifixion. Right. So I think there's just yeah. layers and layers and layers of things in here that comes along and why it's appropriate for, why it's appropriate for Jesus to be the one uh, or the word of God at that time to be the one who's going to bring that, that punishment into place. And what's also very, very interesting is that you have in Revelation 12, the image of the woman who's, you know, produces, uh, it has 12 stars, which is a representative of, of Israel. And then you have uh, the birth of the Messiah. And then you have the red dragon empire mm -hmm. that's the same description as in revelation 13 and revelation 17 is waiting to devour the baby because that's representative of the seven beast empires right mm -hmm. and it is trying to stop israel from achieving their destiny yeah and it is trying to ensure the word doesn't complete his mission to right. save humanity and they're actually going to try and kill jesus when he's you know herod within mm -hmm. the yep. roman mm -hmm. empire of that time is going to want to try and kill jesus when he's before he's born and then mm -hmm. when he's a child right i mean there's this ongoing yeah. thing that is there and then satan offers the civilizations of the world which is you know dominated by at that time rome again which is representative of the beast kingdoms like mm -hmm. the layers and layers and layers of the imagery is just amazing um and so i think that's why he he was sent is just because it's was was appropriate yeah. to do that with everything that was going to happen you know over the next four thousand years or so I remember I, I uh, freaked out everyone in a Kung Fu class I was taking one year when they got to talking about that moment, you know, when Satan takes Jesus up, you know, and shows him all the empires of the world. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, I told him, like, guess what? That's because this is his world. Like, he's the prince of the pow you know, mm -hmm. powers of the air, and he's yep, been he, given he, dominion he, over this world. He couldn't <laughs> offer what he didn't have authority over. That's what, I, yes. I was like, look, he can't, he can't offer what, he can't tempt you with what he doesn't mm -hmm. have, you know. Yep. And everybody in the Kung Fu class, like, looked at me like I was a Satanist. It's like, no, no, you don't get it. Like, yep. you know. <laughs> and, and, Je and Jesus did not deny he had that authority. Right. Yeah. Jesus and he didn't, didn't deny he was reigning over them right yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah it just you know so I, i've realized that it was one of the first experiences where you're like okay maybe i can't go this deep with a lot of like maybe we should you know <laughs> maybe we should right. maybe step it first a little right. bit um so i do want to go deep though i want to ask something actually uh really kind of unusual but it's it, it just kind of stuck in my brain uh when jacob wrestles with the angel at Peniel. Um, there's a yep. moment where the angel tells him, basically, the sun's coming up, release me, you know, let go of me. And then he touches his hip, you know, dislocates his hip so he can, and not before you give me my blessing. And there's a struggle. Um, what is the issue with the sun coming up? That kind of has that, that echo of, of vampirism, but I'm sure that's a good angel. So do you have any insight into that? Well, I, I wonder whether or not that is the angel of the lord because it, it appears as a man which yeah there's a physical confrontation as just, and just as we talked about and then he blesses this angel is blessing jacob afterwards yeah. and that uh not just a small blessing and right. typically blessings come from the angel of the Lord and God, right? the word <laughs> right, of God yeah. and God. That's where the <laughs> blessings come from. Not a normal sort of angel. Mm -hmm. um, 
they may carry the message of a blessing because that's their duty, but this expresses a level of authority that to me is higher than an angel. And so when we look at um, who, uh, oh, and what, what the blessing actually is, is that he's going to change his name to Israel, mm -hmm. okay, which is interesting, which is reminiscent of Deuteronomy 32, of the sons of God, right? The angels. He's, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And and it is representative of the sort of the, the root meaning to Israel, which was not Israel was at that time because they weren't. It's a compounded word that is, you know, he's giving them the power of the God most high as, as, as that's going to translate, right? Mm -hmm. as, and so... Yeah. He is then spoken of in that sort of terms as the great one. Uh, he's going to be one of the great one and one of the great princes of the earth. He's going to have strength to lead this nation for what it was going to do. And it would be, you know, a significant struggle. So he is blessed with additional power, whether it's just in spirit or in strength or, or whatever that blessing is. It's a significant blessing. And you're going to get the 12 tribes from Jacob, right? That's going to produce Judah. That's going to be. So it makes sense again that that, that just might be um, Jesus and mm. uh, or at least the word wow. at that point in time. And what's mm -hmm. interesting is that it's the name Peniel. Right. Yeah. That is named afterwards. It doesn't say it's the name of the angel. He just you ask the name of the angel and then we, we get the the. The detail that he names that place, uh, actually Peniel and Panuel. It's two different spellings that are there, two different Hebrew words, but they mean the same thing. It means either face of God or facing God. Hmm. So he named the place after wrestling with this angel who has the ability to bless and then he names that place afterwards and i don't think he was able to provide the name because and i probably didn't get it anyways and even if he did he wouldn't understand the name of the word of god because it would be <laughs> right. too much to understand but he names the place peniel which means facing god and i think this was facing the word from god yeah. who, who was word with them made flesh yeah and then mm. at sunlight you know, again, it's kind of like prophetic of the resurrection that God is going, that Jesus is going to rise, you know, on the sun, you know, on the morning of the, uh, of the third day. And what happens on that third day, and in this case, the day after the wrestle is, is something new is happening and changing. And Jacob is starting out on his great commission at this point in time because he's just been blessed. Yeah. And who does he meet the next morning? Esau. Esau. And he, oh, the and reconciliation. The mm -hmm. reconciliation, oh, yeah. which puts the bad what he's going to be doing going forward right yeah. everything sort of sort of resolved from kind of a spiritual basis so this is the great uh, commission to go forward and he makes peace with esau and and from that point on we get the sort of the story of the developing um nation of israel and how that's going to work through the exodus that we just talked about so i think when you look at um, that word, um, <clears throat> you know, Peniel, that's, that to me is the significant sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I also look at this is, is that it, it, it is also testing his resolve in the wrestle, right? Yes. Yeah. And in that to see, does this individual have what it's going to take or do okay. i have to start over again right? yeah. <laughs> because yeah de dealing with humans here <laughs> we're very <laughs> stiff-necked people just mm -hmm. as israel became stiff-necked yeah so yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's that and in this whole sort of process is there's this courage that is sort of being injected i think into um in, in into Jacob and yeah. a lot of people will take this whole 
encounter of with the Jacob and the angel as being sort of a sexual connotation with the touching uh, really? of, of the private parts and it's it's a, it's an occult take on the story yeah yeah it's a mutation yeah. it, it is and he does seem to touch between the legs and in that hollow I thought it was right? a dislocation of the hip I thought that well, was that that was what happened with touching into that hollow yeah okay right and mm. and so it prevents um Jacob from wrestling any, any anymore and from but, running away mm -hmm. but and what we do know away. is is that um uh, you know that's the word for Sino so it's a tendon that is kind oh, of really? broken as you take that back to the Hebrew and which is why you know there was this sort of tradition afterwards that the, the Israelites didn't eat that tendon because now it was considered something special that happened that was touched Jacob was touched by the word of God not only wrestled but mm -hmm. physically touched um, and in that particular spot and that could also be looked at, a, at a, you know as a blessing to be able to reproduce in great numbers as well my speculation but there's a whole bunch of different yeah. things going on in there but for Christians be aware that the, the occultists will spin this into mm. just as they like to spin a lot of that type of thing into the patriarchs and bring them to being not who they were, who we thought they were is what they're trying to do is weaken your faith. Yeah. Mm. I noticed that when I was in ordination class, uh, because I had the, uh, I had the experience of being in an ordination class uh, led by someone who was more Luciferian than, than anything. And there was always this, the take was always this progressive modern, they call it progressive, but it's really like you so, frequently and eloquently point out gary ancient it's this ancient you know no luciferian yeah either gnosis or pre-flood nephilim kind of ideology this you know uh, that just seeks to dismantle everything it mm -hmm. just erodes your faith mm -hmm. you know that like oh moses didn't really do all these things you know jacob really had this kind of experience instead yeah you know, and <clears throat> and it's just constantly there to just chip away, mm -hmm. you know, to chip away and dismantle the um, the numinous nature yeah. of and, you and know. yeah, and then draft them into polytheism. So just right. like they and draft then, yeah. Moses, and yeah. they're going to draft Jacob in because Jacob mm -hmm. is very important to them in some of their imagery. Yeah, particularly yeah. with Jacob's ladder that happens, you know, a few chapters before in mm -hmm. Genesis twenty eight. Right. And so yeah. they adopt that whole imagery and the whole thing into their polytheist beliefs. So they're not trying to totally dismiss Jacob. Yeah. They want to change it. They want to, you know, they that word that they're using today. This is an ancient expression that's called reimagining. Uh huh. Yes. So when, like when, when you hear the globalists mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about reimagining something, whether it's the police huh? or whatever else, yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah, they are taking something that is that is designed by God, and you know, bastardizing it, mutating it, malforming yes. it, and counterfeiting it, counterfeiting yeah. it, and twisting it into their own nefarious image that is only meant to corrode and separate you from God. Yeah. So Jacob is a very important figure to them. Yeah, He's not mentioned that much, but he is in certain aspects. But people don't realize the imagery that they take out of the Bible that they rely on for a lot of their belief. Yeah, and there's, you know, Jacob's story is such a such one of extremes, especially you know with the the deception in the beginning and how unmanly he is, you know, and and just he's he's a very contemptible character, so he's so yeah. easily uh, co-optable, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, um, Nick had a actually a, a really interesting. You had something about the pineal gland and Jacob's ladder that you were kind of interested in asking about. Well, we were talking about that over our uh, fire pit. Oh yeah, our Mother's uh, Day fire pit. Yeah, yeah. Mother's Day last weekend. <laughs> where all the best conversations take yeah. place, by the way. Yeah. You know? Well, <laughs> the uh, you know is is that where we get the word pineal gland because that's that's the uh, that's the gland in our brain. It yeah. They, yeah, it's the one that's known for opening so, the third eye or what gives us our dreams or what might release when we die. And that could explain yeah. people's near-death experiences and so forth. Yeah, I, I haven't checked the, the etymology on uh, 
Peniel. Um, I'm not convinced that, well, I, would, I shouldn't say that, um, but it may have a connection as an etymology back to Peniel or Paniel, right? Yeah. and a connection to Jacob. I suspect whether or not there's an etym etymology there or not that's public, it is that connection. And here's how they connect it. And it's got, you know, again, a lot to do with Jacob's ladder as well, because they combine this into a similar kind of story. So in the occult, before I, I sort of uh, get to what I started with there, because I want to preface it, in the occult, and I talk about the pineal gland in my book a little bit. And this is a top of the um, spinal cord or, or, the, or the vertebrates of the backbone, right? Mm -hmm. And there's 33 vertebrates that they like to talk about in the backbone, which again should mm -hmm. ring bells yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Right. On, yeah. on how it's being used. And a top, and a top of that is the small bud or this node uh, that they call the pineal gland. And in the occult, it is the th kind of like the root to the third eye. Right. It may be represented in the forehead, but this is the real contact uh, mm -hmm. that needs to be working to activate the third eye. And the third eye is the doorway to the God of this world, yeah. right? Satan. Yep right yep. and to enlightenment to yes. Trans unlimited and... knowledge and, uh -huh. and to promising godhood mm -hmm. and so they then imagine then that the ladder in the allegory is like this pineal cord right and at the top oh. is where the godhead is yeah right mm -hmm. and that you will actually be introduced to this um enlightened being that yeah. when you're in contact with just as if jacob were to climb that ladder or just as he w met face to face mm -hmm. with the angel that he wrestled with you would meet this enlightened being yeah hmm. right yeah. And, but they co-opt it to who that enlightened being is in yes. the um in the occult to uh, generally Satan or an equivalent to Satan, but they sometimes use different enlightened beings, which would be, you know, the pantheon of God. Mm -hmm. It picks sort of separate kind of ones. So I suspect there's a connection right back to that in an etymology, but um, I can't say I've actually checked that out. It may or may not be there, but I know the occult takes that and just loops it in right it just yeah. fits so mm -hmm. well, they change something else and then they change the name to this so i mean who knows how they came about with that and if you just do enough dmt then you too can see the machine elves and travel to you know higher planes of existence and yeah. achieve yep. christ consciousness and you know yep. all this mm -hmm. you know yeah all this uh all this stuff that just <clears throat> you know it's it's all so it's also wayward you know, mm -hmm. it's just it, fruitless. It's mm -hmm. like, man, you're just living under the delusion of a false light and the pursuit yeah. of something that's not really going to lead you into anything other than the, yeah. just the job. Yeah, but it's not honest. a false experience, though. It's not a false no. experience because a lot of people who do DMT will well, report seeing the same demonic type entities. Right. We got turned on to this. Uh, and this is something that uh, I would like to do a little bit more research and then come back to you with later on, Gary, because I think you might find it interesting. We found... Uh, um this guy who had aggregated all these stories of dmt experiences and they all shared the similar veins of um basically long story short uh demonic interactions on these higher planes and then demonic competition like one demon would be here and give you this brilliant information coming as an angel of light you know sort of or i say demon may have been a fallen angel but you know definitely a satanic entity and then another one would come in and the first one would get afraid of the second one and like probably i think five or six different stories all correlate these same things mm. you know it's weird it, well and it's weird because you know in the jacob's ladder story you know uh, correct me if i'm wrong gary but i don't think jacob climbs the ladder he just observes nope. it correctly. Yeah. 
right so right so there's this there's this dichotomy here between like just seeing the ladder and perhaps yep. being humble enough to yep. not try to ascend the ladder yep. and then the right. ego of the you know the sort of the sorcerer the alchemist who wants to harness the power mm -hmm. of the wants to ascend yeah. and wants to ascend yeah. Yeah. yeah and so typically that ladder i mean it's very very popular in some of the imagery in freemasonry and rosicrucianism yes that you're to climb that ladder those are like the degrees of the knowledge of enlightenment right, right? to mm -hmm. get there to be an adept level and that um you will see them climbing that ladder in masonic imagery which yeah. is different than what is again it's counterfeited and it's corrupted to mm -hmm. their form of, of of belief so yeah it's 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 interesting stuff but it is all of this you know all of this world that is run by satan so it's mm -hmm. just all designed to lead people away from god it's mm -hmm. just as simple as that and to you know appease your ego you know yeah. you um we talk about the Egyptians, we talk about uh, the Masons, uh, we talk about these ancient cultures. There's one question that uh, Nick and I uh, sort of touched on at our fireside chat, which is strangely enough where we came up with <laughs> most of the questions yeah. for this yeah. awesome interview. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I kind of wanted to ask you just a really simple question. Um, throughout all of history, whether it's Egypt, Babylon, the Greeks, Romans, today, um it's never gone away it's never changed why does gold matter mm. yeah so when we talk about gold it is you know it resonates at in so many different areas right yeah. but we have to always go back and put our shoes on in the ancient terms again we need to get into their shoes yeah and because you have to have an understanding of what was going on and what was going on was we had gods interacting with humans right and they were mm -hmm. physical yeah even though they're immortal and their physical bodies in a corrupted world can be corrupted as well right mm -hmm. right which is some of the reasons why some people would put forward that they would have you know saw human females as being beautiful and wanted them for their wives that's part of mm -hmm. interacting in the physical world in a from a physical body an oikatarian that they put their spirit into which had dna and the ability to to pass on that dna so that's the first thing but then you're subject in this world to that interaction and how do they keep that body immortal or do they just shed it and get another one well you get this ancient sort of tradition in um ancient ology about this elixir of uh, immortality that will come down in in different ways and the elixir of changing lead to gold right right so there's something in there and there's also the understanding of gold in the occult is the idea of purity the idea of wisdom or the knowledge cult uh, and it's something that's essential to immortality as being a god, you have to have unlimited knowledge and immortality as a god. It, it's, it's an imagery to them of light, which is an allegory for knowledge again, and truth and immortality. So there's a, there's a distinct understanding that gold is associated with being a god and immortality and knowledge, right? Yeah. So then when you get into um the understanding of some of the mythologies that's in ancient history about things associated with gold it starts to make some sense so you have this golden fleece yes right this is a material right it's fleece yeah. it's like fleece of sheep that's going to be making into gold you also have golden apples which is you know yes uh discordia you know, the order of the golden dawn yeah uh, which yeah. is typically mm -hmm. thought of as the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil mm -hmm. from the tree in eden so it's that knowledge is logo yeah you know mm -hmm. yeah and the uh and so you have that immortality of this clothing 
And then we find out that in most all ancient cultures that took the time to document it, and most of them did, is the gods wore clothes made of gold. Oh, interesting. Really? Which, yeah. And yeah. so I think this was giving them some sort of protection to that body in the physical world that they had. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's what I think. And it also has all of the allegorical imagery that goes with it. Now that starts to make some sense that their spurious offspring, the Nephilim kings and queens, would like to have clothing made out of gold. And they would have uh, masks and things of gold. And why they you know, hoarded gold because they may have looked at that as well as things like drinking blood and other things to, to yes. preserve that, that immortality. And so I think all of that is kind of um, intermeshed because there's a strong doctrine that not only is gold indestructible and all the other features, it yeah. is a piece of physical immortality not phys not spiritual immortality that's something different right 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 but something of the physical world that represents Im immortality mm -hmm. and that the whole meaning of this is and and i would also think that you would have the gold which it is as we're in, and as we're increasingly finding more is going to be used more in technologies and things yes. that because it's uh, such a good energy and power, right? So again, representative yeah. of the gods. So all of that sort of comes down through the secret societies, through the alchemists and everything else and the Rosicrucians. Yeah. Uh, and it's all sort of interconnected, but it has, I think, several different layers to it. Yeah, it is. And it's such this, it's just, there's a through line of gold throughout all the oh, yeah. ancient empires yeah, and yeah. all the civilizations, and it's a good conductor. Yes. But it's always the basis of uh, it's a good electrical conductor, but it's always the basis yep. of any fiat currency, yep. you know, yep. uh, I guess up until we get to like the petrol dollar age. But I remember even 10. Well, oh, so that ahead. was my, that was going to be my last point on it was getting yeah. to the money of it now, because mm -hmm. why would you, you know, have something that was used as currency, I guess, because of its extreme value. But that's just not where it stops. So they didn't use paper money back in the day they used yeah. coins which are mm -hmm. orbs circles and they would put the image of their gods or their kings on there who were mm -hmm. depicted as gods and an orb was what they uh, understood as represented a god and an image would generally be put within the orb of that god or that demigod and so that money would would represent to their subjects that that's who you're to worship right yeah there is that well it's that whole you cannot serve god and mammon you know thing yeah. and so it there is a correlation between, yes. right yeah. Yeah, yeah it's related between that and then these things that covet yeah. you know they say you know uh bs talks but money yeah. walks you know yeah, and yeah. and like it just it all wow it, it, there's yeah the correlation yeah. between like what you're supposed to worship and the actual physical yeah. representation of yeah. these gods now. yeah it's, it's idolatry it's on a, a multiple levels yeah when it comes now to yeah now, now yeah. let's take that concept to one more level okay yeah, okay okay yeah. Yeah. i'm ready yeah so, <laughs> gold is very shining Yes. Right. And we talked about the imagery of light. So it would represent the sun and the sun god that we were talking about earlier right. and, a, and an allegory uh, for for Satan. So you have this imagery that is representing a shining aspect. And just as angels are shining opalescent beings particularly in their spirit, but also thought when they take a physical form and just as their spirit's offspring, they shone from their eyes and they were called the shining ones. Mm -hmm. And gold is the shining coin that would yeah. be the most shiniest of the coins that would represent all of that imagery. Does that tie into why in some of those ancient cultures, they'd put coins on the eyes of the deceased? Yeah. Oh yeah, that That's makes sense. Are you saying that the uh, the offspring of the fallen angels, the Nephilim, 
uh, some of them were known as the shining ones because of that. They were all known as the shining ones. Yeah. They had eyes that. That glowed. They would light up a room. I miss that. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, and you see that imagery, let's say, in um, Stargate with the uh, Gauld and they speak their eyes, Sean. Mm -hmm. Um, And we also get the same imagery in the book of Enoch with uh, the birth of Noah that they thought when he was born because he lit up the whole room and he had this white ruddy skin um, that he was the offspring of the angels. Right. Okay. But yes, they were called the shining ones. Wow. And it's that reminds me, you know, like in a lot of uh, Renaissance art, mm-hmm. uh, religious art, uh, when they depict demons, uh, they're this, you know, grotesque, bulbous eyes, shed wings, a lot of animal features. But in a lot yep. of those, their eyes, their their eyes are big. set to contrast. They're big and they're bright. Like they contrast. They're big and they, yeah, contrast and they wrap around usually as well. So Akhenaten is particularly represented that way. You know, uh, there's also, they they touch on that a little bit in um, uh, that movie, that M. Night Shyamalan movie, Unbreakable, when uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character is, who's a comic book aficionado. Yep. Who's explaining to, I think to Bruce Willis, you know, that like the villains always have really big eyes and he correlates it to a a more anthropological thing as far as like predators, you know, it's more of an animalistic predatory nature. But I think there's an undercurrent, you know, a correlation there between the two. Interesting. Yeah, and you get sort of similar depictions with the aliens and and right the grays and then you get shining eyes and glowing eyes with uh, bigfoot there's a there's a consistent stream with um creatures that were created by fallen angels that have that characteristic of that of those shining eyes Mm. but the eyes would light up a room that's interesting well and you know i did that for the heavenly realms novels where like all the angels just had like fiery eyes they had no pupils and no irises even the the good angels and the bad angels is there uh is there any sort of biblical uh, it's been so long since i've looked it up but is there any sort of biblical reference to angels have whether they're good or bad having any sort of luminous eyes not that not that i'm aware of yeah Um, but you know when they take a physical presence they have the ability to take whatever form they want right yeah so they would have that ability to do that and to mesmerize with it you know but that that form would always have a shining sort of essence to it because yeah they're you know the cool thing about uh interviewing gary is we ask him a question like why does gold matter? And then you give us <laughs> you give us like yes. at least half a dozen amazing reasons. Yeah, man, <laughs> why gold matters? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, so I had uh, I had another question that was kind of a, a pet of mine. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, and we're past the 45 minute mark, so we can like actually talk about this now. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, a lot of talk in the QAnon community about Jasara and Nasara. Um, and how it's going to be, you know, uh, backed by gold along with a lot of other things, property, you know, real estate resources, stuff like that. And, uh, this is not a new thing. This thing, this whole Jasara Nisara reset, you know, great awakening, you know, uh, Christ consciousness sort of thing has been around forever, but it's manifested in the last several years with the QAnon phenomenon. And I, and I've always been a little suspicious of Q. I think a lot of what they say is right but their solution is always very uh luciferian it's very human it doesn't really involve Mm -hmm. the biblical lord um so and then there's this video out there where you can see general flynn who is a uh he's second in command under trump and trump is like the leader of the QAnon movement right um and we like trump in a lot of ways but this is just part of this whole conspiracy theory thing But there's a video where General Flynn is giving the same um, prayer uh, that the prophetess for St. Germain was giving. And everybody loves, you know, all the QAnon people. They love the Jasara Nasara thing. They love the gold reset. They don't really like to talk about the St. Germain aspect of it, (laughs) you know. And St. Germain is such a strange character. Mm -hmm. There's all this, you know, 
revolving thing about is he Lucifer reincarnated? Is it tied to this, you know, this currency revaluation and the French Enlightenment? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, there's a there's a no, 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 there's so much there. I'm sorry, <laughs> there is yeah. a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's just start with uh, QAnon. Um, sure. That that Q is should be a red flag, um, really? and understand that globalists operate from a cattle herding tactic and strategies that mm -hmm. they implement. So polar opposites, right? And trying to cattle herd you into the middle and the open arms of the of the globalists uh -huh. so we always have to be careful of ones that are trying are saying well we're going to pick your side because they like to divide it into two uh, but they're really doing the same thing just as you got a lot of people saying well there's good globalists and there's evil globalists there's good nephilim okay. and there's evil nephilim right. it's the same agenda hercules is a good squabbles guy. that are going there on, are white right? witches and there are dark witches yeah mm -hmm. good, good magic yeah there's black slytherin magic. and hufflepuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's it's the, it's the same religion. It's the same pantheon. It's the same end yeah. goal. So what does Q stand for? Now, nobody really answers uh, that. Yeah. And uh, I in in I do believe globalists and secret societies and polytheists they put imagery in everything that they do. So Q, if you go back to the Hebrew word for Cain, it's Kayan, and it starts with Q. No kidding. Yeah, and Kabbalah, oh, mystical Judaism, isn't a K, it's a Q in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. as no translated in, yeah, so I wonder at that choice of Q, um, and I wonder whether or not they are just a different side of the coin of, of the end time um, world government agenda or not. So um just be careful with them and watch more of what they say, what they do, and match things up and evaluate them. But don't get too hooked into it, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. But just just be careful with it is, is all I'm saying. So, And then as you get into St. Germain, um, I don't know whether or not they're associated with St. Saint, Saint Germain, but he's, a very, as you say, a very interesting character. And... He may even be, in terms of his representation, older than what they say, yeah. because he typically comes around in about 15 or 1600 out of Transylvania, mm -hmm. as, as, I, as I recall, which again mm -hmm. would be, you know, you know, yeah, Transylvania, the bloodlines of the two Atha de Danan, who are the shining ones, and yeah. the Vlad the Impaler, Order Draconis, and the one, mm -hmm. the, you know, the character that Dracula was based on, and that immortality of drinking the blood and things yeah. like that. He's also considered as a Rosicrucian, right? Oh, that's right. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And they believe that he was bacon. Some yep. people even say he was Samuel after yeah. Samuel's, but you know, after I guess after Samuel might have been awakened or not. But oh wow. Um, anyways, so there's there's different sort of in incarnations of uh, Saint Germain. There there are um, people in the 20th century who say that they met saint germain mm -hmm. that he may even still still be alive or maybe that's another reincarnation as as you would as you had stated it i certainly wouldn't call it that and i'll tell you what i'll call it in, in a minute or two but he seems to be like an immortal human is kind of how he's being sort of represented right and that um he is uh, the one that in their belief system is going to bring about the age of Aquarius. Yes. The new age of Atlantis. And then uh, again, another um, sort of thought process that he uh, is connected to Bacon. They say he ascended to the great white masters uh, mm -hmm. in 1684. So that would mean then he would be sort of revisiting the earth and, and coming about again. So there's there's a tradition in polytheism that's called um, incarnation. So in the new age, the Christ consciousness is an incarnation. Yes. Right. In polytheism, as in the book of Narnia, uh, people are going to get upset at me about this, but you have this. <laughs> Go this, for it. This, I got your back. You, <laughs> you have this lion god, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Named Aslan, Aslan, Mm -hmm. who is in another world. And Lewis describes him as if Jesus were to incarnate in another Mm -hmm. world. That's how he imagined. So he's reimagining him in that way in another world. Narashima is a lion demigod who had Shiva incarnated into him, whom Aslan is based upon. No kidding. Hmm. Yeah. Buddha, and, and Shiva did many incarnations. Buddha hmm. received the incarnation of Vishnu and is thought about in Antichrist type hmm. terms as the new Buddha for the coming Antichrist. And so this term incarnation is something that fallen angels tend to do. Mm -hmm. And it's not like this possession aspect. It is more like a symbiotic relationship as with Buddha, with Vishnu, Buddha receives additional power. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Satan, he actually does this at least once in 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 the Bible, and maybe twice if you look at the the cash. He may incarnate into the cash to deceive Eve, because, but he's not the one who loses his arms and the legs. But he may provide him the courage to do that. Just as Satan enters into Judas to oh, give yeah. him the courage to, to right. betray Jesus. So he's providing something. The mm. dragon will receive will provide the power to antichrist in the end time Mm -hmm. so antichrist receives his power so there may be this angelic incarnation into an antichrist type figure for the end time yeah so there's a connection there Mm -hmm. and then what we're told about bringing this back to um saint germain he is um thought of as the lord of civilization and that he is the incarnation that's coming for the end time to bring mm-hmm. about the end time so he's this ascended master and he's incarnating and i think what's going on is is you're having either fallen angels or demons because shamans will and adepts will bring in a demon that will add some power as well. But then you still got two hosts that are fighting over, and it's usually the demonic host that wants to dominate. The angel doesn't need to be there. The demon does because it can't interact in the world without yep. being in a physical world. The right. angel has more powers to do things, and so that's more symbiotic. And so I still think oh. there's it's a less symbiotic thing, and it's a demon-dominated situation with, with the adepts taking a demon in. But this seems to be hmm. like an incarnation doctrine for the Antichrist that's coming as a Christ consciousness in the end time and preparing people for that. And in their belief system, Jesus was like Buddha. Jesus was like Hermes. Jesus was like Cain. Jesus was like all the great prophets sent to humankind on the way to godhood. So the way of Cain, the way of Taoism, the way of the Tao, and the way of godhood as as they're Mm. presenting it. And so Antichrist will be just like another one of these sent down in an incarnated format that will be the end time. And a lot of people believe that's going to be Saint Germain. I think not. Really? Okay. No, because Antichrist is going to be something a little bit more unique than just that. Oh, yeah. He's going to be more powerful. He's going to be um, something that absolutely mystifies the whole world. And he's going to say things and do things that are unheard of. Mm -hmm. And he's going to slander the celestial beings and God. And he's going to wage war in heaven with along with Satan. And they're going to throw some of the starry host down. Mm -hmm. If we see, and this is an if, because I don't tend to buy into everything, but I know what their belief system is to a certain degree. Um, I think if we're going to see something like that, it's going to be uh, St. Germain, as I say, something like a St. Germain incarnating again, I would suggest false prophet. Yeah. 
Yeah, mm. which will probably mm. be another incarnation of some sort, right? That makes the way for the Antichrist, mm -hmm. just as you know, John the Baptist and Elijah make the way for for God. So you're yeah. going to you need something that's very very powerful that is going to counterfeit what Elijah will do in the end time. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes sense because so much of the St. Germain uh, conspiracy revolves around the St. Germain Trust and the, um, the massive amount of wealth that is stored. In fact, there are a lot of correlations. Some people like even suspect that like Trump yep. is, you know, a manifestation of St. Germain yep. or, or maybe perhaps at least his acolyte in the cult yep. of St. Germain. And yep. to come along and do this great awakening and do the currency revaluation that everybody cares mm -hmm. about, which is Sara and Nassara, which are a lot of Christians yep. and a lot of, you know, really well-intentioned patriotic people. But they there's like this greed aspect to it, yeah. you know, so, and they. Yeah. So, yeah, let's yeah. let's take this up one more level now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Climb that ladder, baby. Oh, so, <laughs> the age of Aquarius that's going to be promised at first yes. is is going to come through Babylon. Right. That's not the religion of Antichrist. Really? OK. What yeah. is Yeah. So. What's interesting as well is, according to you know Alice Bailey, is is that Saint Germain is coming back after 2025. Oh, interesting! Hmm. Really? As, okay. as Why is that? She said, whether that's true or not, that's the time that they're predicting, anyways. So, and so I think um, this is going to come about after the rise of Babylon. That's when you would see an incarnation of Saint Germain if he's the false prophet. But it'll be something like that for the false prophet because it's mm -hmm. going to be different than the false prophets of Babylon that bring Babylon to power because this is the, the false prophet that makes the way for Antichrist as opposed to the plural false prophets that bring about the universal religion with their prophecies of doom. Right. If you don't yeah. unite under one world government and one universal religion, you're going to destroy yourself from the face of the earth. And they're going to make these prophecies and they're going to give you a certain amount of time. And if you don't do it, boom, this contrived catastrophe happens. But yeah. this is something a little bit different with Antichrist and false prophet. I would put it more into there and it'll be look for something like that to uh, bring about Antichrist during his rise to power but not at the beginning because antichrist doesn't take power until the midpoint after he takes credit for armageddon and mm -hmm. he negotiates the seven-year covenant but he's not antichrist at this point he will be but he has to rise to power so he has to defeat another antichrist type figure and jesus says there will be many antichrists just as the epistles of john tells us so he's going to need a war like the gog war the joel one and two war and the mm -hmm. um revelation nine war and mm -hmm. take credit for that where thereafter so this happens before the midpoint but very close to the midpoint after the opening of the abyss just as antichrist is the one who comes up out of the abyss as well so there's a relationship to azazel and or angels or something that comes up out of, out of the abyss and is the one that is going to kill the two witnesses yeah. and is somehow connected maybe through an avatar effect of somehow some way mm -hmm. or just adding a power as the god of fortresses that he's going to to honor but this war happens towards the midpoint of the last of the last seven years that antichrist will take credit for and then move his armies as luke uh the book of luke talks about and the book of daniel talks about to surround Jerusalem with his armies and then set up the abomination. So he needs an Antichrist figure and he needs an Armageddon type of war to fulfill his credentials as well as a false resurrection that comes from that mortal wound with his head. Mm -hmm. And this is all going to be done in sync with the false prophet as well. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, that kind of leads into what probably was Nick's most hotly anticipated question. Oh, yeah. Uh, take it away. All right. Nick. Yes. Uh, so Gog and Magog. Yeah. The traditional end times interpretation of that has been projecting that um, Russia is Gog and 
perhaps Moscow is Magog. I would like your take on that. Are we watching that unfold right now with the war in Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine? We're no? seeing the beginning of sorrows and we're seeing the positioning of the 10 spheres of influences that the political, geopolitical, globalists like to talk about or groups of nations or empires that are going to form. So you're going to see 10 of these groups, just as the Club of Rome divided the world into 10. I think it's going to be a little bit different. So you see Putin wanting not, it's not that he doesn't want to be part of the new world order. He wants a bigger role. So does uh -huh. Xi from the Xia dynasty bloodlines and the dragon creator gods. He wants to do the same thing. And the Europeans want to keep all the other rival bloodlines <laughs> sort of in place, right? And so, again, you, you see this rivalry within their uh, organizations, but they all want the same goal. But there can only be one family that's going to be Antichrist and the nobility that would reign in their false, their counterfeit mm -hmm. millennium that they're promising. So there's going to be rivalries that, that take place. So it's interesting about the word Gog is Gog does not show up in the table of nations, but this is Gog oh, of Magog. Right. Magog shows up. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Who Gog is um, in polytheism. He is one of the giant offspring of the parent God, Iapetus. So really? you have a giant I haven't, I haven't name. Heard that name. I have this. Yeah, he's 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 the one that Poseidon, as an offspring god, takes over for because Iapetus is the god of the sea from the parent god aspect. Oh, okay, okay. And and so all the offspring gods they kind of take the same mythology as what was given the parent gods. They all move up in rank, just okay. as in the Saba, the army type of thing. So that's that's who. Yeah. Um, so who Iapetus is. And a lot of times the, 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 the myths become, and the legends become conflated because of that. And so Magog is also a son of Iapetus. And Magog's the one in, uh, mentioned in the Table of Nations. Yeah. And the other one that's of interest is Albion. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. These are all Albion. the same, also giants that are mentioned in English mythology. Yep. Right. And Albion is part of the root word where the word Elbigens comes from. And LB being white, um, you know, as in white bread, as in blanched, as whatever, and gens as in the genealogy to one particular patriarch. So when you hear terms like the Elbigens, that's a genealogy of the two author da, 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 and one of the one branch and the Elvin Magianic bloodline of the Cathars and the Elbigensians um, mm. for their dragon messiah. I know I'm, I'm looks like I'm going in different directions here, but I'm, I'm going to pull it back in. So what we get what happens in the Bible a lot and there's some examples in polytheism where you get patriarchs in the Bible who take their names after giants. And I think their names are changed to giant names afterwards as a denunciation as to what they did, which was go intermarry with the giants. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think that, that that happens quite often. And you get, like, let's say... Um, Nimrod is thought in some occultic accounts to be before the flood and after the flood, but Nimrod could be a name that was a giant before the flood, like, like say, is in the Lost King of Book of oh, King Og has Nimrod as a giant before the flood. Gilgamesh has another example. He is a post alluvian second incursion giant, son of Lugalbanda and a female mother goddess who's two-thirds god one-third human and then you get a gilgamesh and enoch book of giants who's there with enoch the evil who is you know trying to get the interpretation of this dream to see whether or not they can prevent the flood from actually coming about oh, right really mm, interesting yeah, so you have a giant before the flood that's gilgamesh and gilgamesh afterwards so mm. it's not uncommon just as hercules has an antediluvian name as well because he's the son of zeus which is an offspring god of a giant yeah. after the flood 
Okay, so that's the why it's important to understand the flood and the offspring gods, in my opinion, in terms of how I understand things. So you have Gog as being this end time, as you take that back to Greek and Hebrew, as an allegory for an end time Antichrist figure. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is the same battle as I've talked about as Antichrist will take credit for, which is the Gog War, Joel 1 and 2. Joel 3 is the Armageddon War and the Revelation War of uh, Revelation 9 with the 200 million people that everybody thinks is Armageddon and will at the time as well. And that happens as an extension of what comes up out of the, the abyss, right? So you see all that timing moving towards the midpoint of the last seven years. So now Gog and Magog, so he's Gog of Magog and the chief prince or the chief Rosh of Meshech. And so you have Magog and that area in Scythia where they originally um, migrate to before you get a migration of Scythians and or Magogites or Muscovites as you take that all sort of back to through etymology through their genealogical history, they are going to migrate up into the Kiev region. These are Tartarians. Yes, the these Tartarians. are the same. Yeah, these are post diluvian Tartarians. And again, to understand Tartaria, you have to understand before and after the flood. And these are the same ones that are going to migrate into Russia and into Mongolia, right? And so Genghis Khan mm -hmm. is described as white and as tall and oh, as right. a horseman yeah. and mm -hmm. is depicted okay. like wow. that. These are Tartarians. And they take their, their genealogies back to the four different types of Indo-Aryans after the flood. But where I'm going with all of this and in terms of the Russian war is that you have this families, these bloodline families of giants, because that's who the Scythians are. They are the mm -hmm. Tuatha Du Danann, right? They, they not only migrate up the Danube into Norway, but into Germany and into uh, Romania and into uh, Ukraine and Russia, and then you also have the red-haired ones for the most part that are going into Ireland, England, and Scotland, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you have this Scythian, Tartar and they're called Tartarians, and Cossacks as the original bloodlines to the original czars that begin in Kiev. And one of those royal bloodlines that comes out of that, that is the bloodline of the original czars, which will be taken over down the road by the Romanovs, who are sort of a branch out of this ori these original families. This is the family called the Putyanin. No kidding. Yes. Now, the name Putin comes out of nowhere in about the 1850s, depending on which researcher you're reading. It'll say it's his great-grandfather or his grandfather, but the name comes out of this. nowhere. Yep, I've heard this before. He just And his manifest. father moves to St. Petersburg, just in and around World War One, or just before or just after, I can't quite recall. Um, and so what happened in the tradition in Russia and in um, the Ukraine is if the royal families had children outside of wedlock, they wouldn't give them the full name. They would mm -hmm. give them part of the name. And that's thought to be the source of Putin from wow. Putin. And the name comes out of nowhere, just kind of like Gog just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And so also now overlay the double eagle imagery. And he's got two areas that he's going to draw on that he's going to make as the uh, emblem for Russia again. But I won't go into all the minutiae on this. I have a document on this if people want it, by the way. Just get a hold of me. I'll send it to you. Um, and that uh, he, what Putin is trying to do is set up his bloodline in what he believes is ancestral empire. Really? And that's the motivation behind what he's doing. He's not going to stop. Interesting. And Setting so this is the, and so when you relate that, the chief prince of Meshach, that's the root word for Moscow. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Makba. And so when you and when you start to connect all of that, 
is is now you have the chief prince of of Moscow, which is Putyanin, who believes he has royal bloodlines, trying mm -hmm. to reestablish the original Kievan czars and that original empire of Tartaria for his empire. So that's the real reason he wants it. Yes. He wants Kiev. He wants Kiev. Wow. That's why he, has, that's why he hasn't destroyed Kiev yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He doesn't want to do that. <laughs> the Tartarian Empire. Yeah. So um, he's going to be after the Baltic states and all oh, of those yeah. borderlines. It may even include Finland. Um, wow. But that's what he wants to put back together. Whether or not he gets it all or not, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But you're going to see these 10 kings be bloodlines. And there are bloodlines all over the world oh, that yeah. still exist. Wow. Wow. The Tartaria thing <laughs> is, uh, you know, we I think we wanted to talk about it a little bit last time, but I don't think we had time. It's it's interesting how, especially lately with Kiev and with Ukraine and with Russia, Tartaria has, I've noticed, really kind of circled back into the conversation a lot more for mm -hmm. a lot of people online. Yeah. And there's there's this this huge connection to the Church of Constantinople with the Eastern Orthodox. He's going to need as yeah. a Antichrist type figure, as in the Gog figure. He's going to need that kind of legitimacy that sort of goes with it. That mm -hmm. also has the double eagle, heraldic heraldic symbology. And I think that's going to be sort of in part that sort of continues to build his power and, and his control yeah. as, as he moves forward. Now, it may not be Putin. It might be an offspring of Putin or a relative of Putin, but he doesn't have much for relatives. So, yeah. But I think, I think that's what's motivating him because everything that happens in the macro level in the world is done at the bloodline level. And he has a, a significant tradition and... Uh, sort of mythos about his mm. Masonic connections at a very high level, yeah. uh, which he wouldn't have without those bloodlines. Right. That is such a cool take. I have heard so many different versions of why Putin is doing this. You know, everything from, you know, he's destroying the the bio labs, you know, and he's a white hat to, you know, he's a tyrant and a dictator and he and Trump are going to take over the world and, you know, kill all the gays or whatever. I don't know. Mm. You know, <laughs> but like to actually to actually hear you talk about the the ties to the bloodlines and the reestablishment of the Tartarian Empire like man that's something no one else has said that's really cool yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah to really get into it, it it's a full show there's a lot of detail that goes yeah. with it. Um, well, that's one of the great things about getting into the Genesis 6 conspiracy, about watching your interviews, about going to your website. It is a singular voice in a lot of ways. And so one of the things uh, I wanted to make sure that we ask you about while we still have time yep. is I wanted to find out about uh, any sort of updates you might have about the sequel to the Genesis 6 conspiracy. Hmm. Well, I'm still having a lot of fun writing it. So. <laughs> Good. I know the feeling. Know yeah. the feeling. Don't we all? It's, yeah. uh, it, it's longer than I, I thought it was going to be. So I'm on, um, I think by the time I get done this chapter, that's going to be a few chapters. So I think it's going to be about chapter 65. I'm hoping to get through that. I'm projecting another 10, maximum 15 chapters at this point in time. Um, so it's taking a little bit longer, but it's I'm, I'm really taking the time to put detail in and particularly detail on all of the sourcing footnotes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, 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 it can take always takes longer than what I anticipate. So I could make it shorter, but I just feel it just needs to be a little bit more complete. And so I, I'm hoping I'm still hoping to have it out this year, but it's not going to be out for the summer. I'm, yeah. I am missed that deadline and that printing and, and the publishers being quite patient is basically saying yeah. when you're ready, send us the sample chapters and we'll really? we go. So, yeah. So I'm hoping awesome. for the fall, yeah. but um I'm in, and again, there's not that many more concepts I want to get in and I'm in on the last end, but then it's, you know, it's a matter of just, you know, 
rereading it a couple thousand times and editing it and then <laughs> right. sending it in. So Tell us about uh, it. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so grateful to hear that you have a publisher who is willing to be patient and supportive with you because that is, you know, not just in the writing world, also in the film world primarily where, you know, there's so much money at stake in the budget. That is such a problem for creatives yep. is you are you are constrained a lot of the time. So it's great yep. to have a publisher who believes in you. Yeah. And it's important as well because this book is designed at Christians 100%, right? And, Good. Yeah. Um, maybe there will be other people who will read my other book and say, okay, I want to look, we'll read this. I hope that. But they'll be a little bit, maybe a little bit more ready for how deep it's going to go into the Bible. And so I want it so it's accurate and and not just accurate but fully sort of explainable and supportable yeah. because if you get if you get some of that detail wrong you lose all of your credibility right so sure mm -hmm. the stakes are so high mm -hmm. well the genesis 6 conspiracy is a book that i love recommending to people because whether you're a long time you know christian like nick and i who are you know just interested in a lot of this esoterica um and how it matters to the current right you know state of being or there have been plenty of non-believers that i have recommended the book to and uh, it seems like the genesis 6 conspiracy despite being such a compendium and such a you know a densely packed lexicon i think even you have said in the past that like you can't read you know multiple chapters at once or you'll blow a synapse you know <laughs> yeah. uh it's so yeah. dense with well-researched yeah. information 100 pages of uh, footnotes and bibliography it's still something that you can sort of hand off to it's it's sort of the gateway drug into the into yeah. the world it seems like your follow-up is going to be something that's much deeper behind that and i can't wait yeah yeah, yeah it, it it is and <laughs> i want to be able to write it in a way that people can read it uh, in the same sort of manner as the first book uh, Good. because there will be that kind of information in it, but that they'll have, and, and I want to have the, we'll see whether or not the editor agrees with it, but I want the footnotes on the pages of the writing. Yes. So mm. there's no flipping yep. that goes on. Right. right. Because I mean, I'm, I dig deep, you know, as I talk, I, I tend to a lot of times refer, refer to the Hebrew word or the Greek word. Mm -hmm. I'm, putting that information in the footnotes right okay yeah right uh -huh. those kinds of things and so you know if i if i say for something like you know gaza city is basically you know the hebrew word aza and it also means the strong ones and that was the city where the avim lived which were still <laughs> there um even after the time of joshua you, you get that information with the backup that sort of comes along with it so that you know that these are a division of the raphaim and they're going to have yeah. to be dealt with later so mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah it's going to be awesome yeah i found myself flipping back and forth quite a bit when i was reading through genesis 6 conspiracy uh, just because there's just so much information, the sources that you cite, it's exhaustive. Uh, but the great thing about it, and I'm glad that you're going to be doing footnotes in the in the sequel. But uh, the great thing about this is that, for example, when I was getting ready for this interview, <clears throat> I wanted to, uh, you know, read about uh, Freemasons. What you wrote about Freemasonry, and you can go straight to that particular part of the chapter, yep. and it's a wonderful encapsulation of just that topic even though yeah. everything that's in this book is laid out loosely on a timeline that makes sense well, from the beginning on it does it does it builds on itself but, but you so don't have to compartmentalized yeah you don't have to read the first half of the book to jump in to to pick a chapter yeah. or a topic in the middle oh and i really get in, in and, understand and just it. started like reading about the fairy kingdom one day while i was yeah. like waiting yeah. for my tires to get rotated or yeah. something you know and it was fascinating and i had no precedent for it at all like the book is so accessible yeah. actually like, it's really and cool. and and that and and that's because i i tried to write each chapter as a mini story that yeah. Would, yeah. Uh, and you know starting at the beginning if you went that way it leads into so many chapters and keeps coming up as the book unfolds so there's if you wanted to go back and you know yeah. read that from the beginning again uh, what i hear a lot and what i certainly found was is boy that sure made sense a lot more sense of what i read at the end of the book the last go around <laughs> yeah right yeah right yeah. But you can read you can read it any way that you want and as much as you want and come back to it when you want. And it's there kind of for a reference book as well. So 
That's such awesome. a great resource. So um, where can people find this book, the first one, before the yeah. sequel's out? Uh, where can people find Genesis 6 Conspiracy? Best way to get hold of the book is uh, from my website, which is the Genesis6Conspiracy.com. That's the number 6Conspiracy.com. And on the website, there's a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters so that you can get a good feel for you whether or not it's the right book for you or not. I think just looking at the table of contents will get your curiosity up. Mm -hmm. um, and if you did want to buy the book, you can go to contact or buy, buy now and buy from the author and get a signed copy. Or from that same page, you can link over to um, Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, BarnesandNoble.com, mm -hmm. or to the Kindle version and get the digital version. So best and easiest way to get it. It's also available on most online bookstores. Um, and if you wanted to support your local bookstore, which I'm a fan of as well, for sure, is that my book is distributed by, you know, for my publisher through a company called Bookmasters out of Pennsylvania, and they supply the bookstores. Okay. So they could order it in for you if you wanted to order it from your local bookstore. So cool. lots of ways to, to uh, get a hold of the book. And um, every way is, is fine by me. It's about getting information out. Yeah. Um, but if you did want a signed copy, that's available as well. Yeah, that's actually how we initially yeah. got this rolling. Yeah, you know, is like we got a couple signed copies. I have a signed copy. Yeah. It's this one. It's this one. <laughs> as you can see, so proud of right it. There, right there. <laughs> it's adorable. I am. I love it. I love it. Um. So, and that is one of the things that's that's so great about you, Gary, is that you are so generous with your information and your time. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not smog sitting on the mountain of gold in the cave, daring anyone to trespass your, your, your fiery breath. You know, uh, people can, you've mentioned it earlier in the live stream. You can, uh, you can email Gary and then you will send them whatever information it is, you know, papers, pamphlets, um, you know, PDFs, I assume. Yeah, I, I generally do it in PDFs and, you know, I don't have one like on St. Germain and some of these more fringe topics, although I guess I do have a lot of fringe topics as well. But <laughs> um, like for Putin, for example, I do have a document on that. I do have a document on Xi and his bloodlines. Oh, cool. And so if I have a document on that subject, I will send it to you and you can, <laughs> again, you know, contact me through the website, through uh, contact the author icon and that email yeah. will go to me or through messenger would be the other way or put a question or a request on my timeline on Facebook. So I, I, I spend a lot of time sending out documents to people on, on things because um, they're they're looking for for some some information on it. So cool. It's very magnanimous of you. So you have it in you have the Genesis six conspiracy in paperback. You have it in ebook. Do you have an audiobook version yet? Yeah. No. And it's probably not going to happen. Um, really? Because it's 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 a difficult project and it's it's high cost for the amount auto audio books aren't a big part of the market <clears throat> that's oh, not okay. the reason i would love to have the audio book but it's yeah it's it's the intersection of cost and expected return that um it, most people will walk away from it now there's been several that have tried yeah and, really <laughs> yeah and they just they just can't make it through. Huh? Can't make it done. There was one group that started a year and maybe almost two years ago now, but last uh, spring, uh, last summer, they told me they had it done. And really? then, yeah, and and they had gone through so much spiritual attack all no, the way whoa. through really? that uh, they almost stopped many times. And wow. again, I've heard that with other people because I, I, I basically tell people create a audio, um, if you like, with all my blessings. Um, yeah. I don't even ask the publisher anymore. Just if I can find somebody to do it, I would do it. And they got <laughs> it done. And they sent me, you know, it's done. We're just going to take, you know, a, uh, you know, a month or so off. And we've been working on it. There's several of them working on it. And then, you know, sort of went quiet and they got a hold of me last October or so. And they said, you know, we can't believe it. It's gone. Like it's what? just been wiped from our Weird. No, I mean, way. yeah. So I kid you not this, I which mean, is borderline impossible, by the way, as someone who's had hard drives die yeah. Yeah, and files. I mean, they're almost always ghost files. Yeah, exactly. Everything. 
you know wow no kidding mm. well yeah, look, they were just they were just heartbroken after so much time that was no, i can't imagine I, yeah. they oh would my be. Gosh. I mean but you know <clears throat> for what it's worth not that this is any great comfort for the thorn in your side that you yep. know the wound uh you know a thief doesn't rob an empty house yes so the devil only yep. goes after you if you're worth something that's true yeah no, no. So, good point i've thought about doing the audio myself but it's the time and the commitment so. sure it is yeah well and you you have so much i thought about that too with my first novel you know but then you realize what all you're going to have to put into it are you good yep. at mixing eq do you have the right setup for yeah. it blah 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 yeah. yeah and as the as the author as the writer your energy and time is best spent moving forward you know and and hopefully finding somebody who yeah you know, we got a good so, narrator but, for you i'm just saying you know, adam burrow <laughs> yeah. will send him your way the line hey, of very sentence <laughs> i would just yeah. love to have it out there and available for people so i'm sure i'm yeah. sure um well uh let's see we had we had two other questions i don't know mm -hmm. if we have time to get to them we are over the two hour mark um can we ask you one more let's ask him about rob oh yeah you want to ask about rob yeah okay yeah. sure um so would you mind indulging us for one more question one last question would that be okay yep. 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 <laughs> thank you okay awesome so um we've been fans of rob skiba uh, Rob Skiba, unfortunately, has passed on, uh, which is a tremendous loss to us. Um, you uh, had some interactions with Rob Skiba. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, I've always been really interested in his because he sort of trades in the same or traded in the same uh, arena as you, which is the Nephilim, the pre-flood world. Uh, he painted a far, you know, a very fantastical vision of that. Especially with this, with uh, the Tower of Babel mm -hmm. uh, in post flood, you know, uh, history, he kind of waffled back and or he went back and forth. He changed, you know, things up a little bit. At first, he thought it was maybe a Stargate. Then, when he got into Flat Earth, he thought it was maybe more of an actual piercing the dome tower. Yep. We just wanted to hear your general take on Rob Skiba's uh, approach and what your take on, you know. If one of those two options for the uh, Tower of Babel was, had any authenticity to it, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and interesting about the concept that you just mentioned about somehow piercing uh, the dome, as in yes. a dome that's in flat Earth. So, yeah, very interesting. Um, I'll, I'll uh, talk about maybe that part at the end. Okay. Um, so that when we look at the uh, Tower of Babel and we look at Nimrod as being the founder of Babylon and the one uh, credited with, you know, imposing this universal religion uh, and being an Antichrist archetype figure and building the city and building this tower, you know, where does this knowledge come from? Yeah, certainly it wouldn't be passed down from Noah and his sons because they wouldn't want to see the, the knowledge that helped destroy the antediluvian world and or the religion of it that would um, start again right because they just right. survived it it was the most horrific event <laughs> right what's yeah. gonna happen <laughs> yeah. in the end times so yeah. yeah you can't imagine that noah would be a fan of that and so this knowledge comes from somewhere and we get an idea of this knowledge in the narrative that acting as one people with one language that nothing that they intend to do will be prevented for them from accomplishing paraphrasing mm -hmm. what, what it says so that means they have some great knowledge that's working together with this whatever belief system and this religion that they're now working with and Babel is understood as a rebellious sort of period, which also suggests that they were worshiping other gods, as all of the imagery would go sort of go mm -hmm. along with that. So let's lay the table on that. So it's interesting that from um, the Masonics and the, uh, societies, the ancient Mason Masonry societies, the ancient Polychronic Polychron Polychronicon, and the Gnostics, is as they have their own traditions about Nimrod because he's a very important figure to them. And he is classified as one of the greatest patriarchs of masonry. 
really? he is thought of as the first He's grand this. master of yeah. masonry after the flood who writes its first constitution yeah even more so than solomon yes yeah. well there's a debate who's greater in oh really the craft. yeah they like to have no that debate. kidding but, yeah so oh, yeah so they do they do so they <laughs> can like you imagine solomon, something on that debate but, yeah. but anyways <laughs> which one of these two awful people was one of the was greater like thanksgiving dinner <laughs> so yes, in this account you have also the two legends of uh lamech and enoch of, of the two pillars the two pillars of lamech are the two, two pillars mm -hmm. of enoch and mm -hmm. one is because they know the flood is coming they want to pass on enoch's knowledge and enoch's religion to the post diluvian world so they do one yeah. pillar that is designed to just uh, survive an apocalypse by fire and the other pillar is designed to survive an apocalypse by water so either way the pillar is going to be found and on there is going to be some knowledge but directions to where the 36,525 books of knowledge and the Enochian religion is going to be found that was stacked on in nine vaults stacked on top of each other and buried below the pyramid because the pyramid was based on the knowledge that Enoch supplied and the knowledge from the angels um, in terms of um, supplying that technology to have those pyramids built. That's what the Gnostics believe. Uh -huh. So... Hermes comes along, you know, part of the Hermes Trismegistus, uh -huh. Hermes uh, Trismegistus, right? And so he's uh, he's a Hermes after the flood, as opposed to the ones before the flood. And he finds the pillar that obviously floated, and finds the knowledge in the it goes to the pyramids, brings yes. this knowledge back to Nimrod, who utilizes this knowledge to. Um, build Babel City and Babel Tower. That's where the knowledge comes from. That's where the religion comes from. And they start to honor the pantheon of gods, just as everything that they're building is designed to honor this pantheon of gods. And they impose this religion on them. So this presumes some significant knowledge that they have. And it's the knowledge of the ancients. It's this powerful knowledge that had developed a society and a system that's more advanced than what we have today and that we're just catching up to that it now that includes dna technology and all sorts of other technologies and maybe different technologies than what we have and this is thought to be the knowledge that might be applied to make nimrod become a gibberine a mighty one oh, that yeah. it changes him because he's born of kush he's not born of fallen mm -hmm. angels like right. The Raphaim are so he becomes, he becomes one, and that so as yeah. you take that back to the Hebrew word, it means to break the covenant, to break the vow. So he's breaking the right. leadership vows and rebelling and going. And so, typically, this is the knowledge that was provided, and they have their hands on great knowledge to what extent we don't know. Typically, we also know that Babel is understood through the Hebrew word. Um, Babel, uh, that it means confusion of languages because God confuses the languages that won't be brought back together to act as one people again mm -hmm. until the end time, right? When this technology is going to be significant again, like the days of Noah was. And so, but Nimrod stays in Shinar, which is Sumer. And then he begins the Assyrians. He begins the Akkadians and the Babylonians come from him, right? So he is sort of the patriarch to this. And he, and he, and he continues with the Magi and that religion, whereas Hermes takes the religion as well from Babel to Egypt. And you get the two pillars, so to speak, of polytheism after the flood with the Magi and the Egyptian yep. priest that spreads to the rest of the world. Okay, so the Akkadians, and there are Sumerian versions as well uh, of the Tower of Babel. Um, there are Armenian versions. There's actually versions in the in the Aztecs and in Central much America. Much like the flood. Uh, yeah, much like the flood. You know, so that probably goes with the people leaving Babel, where that knowledge comes from, right? So, but in Akkadian, the word Babel or Babalu as it's also understood at, has a different 
meaning than confusion of languages. It means Bab in Akkadian as in gateway or stargate. Uh -huh. And yep. E-L is God in Hebrew, and I-L-U is the same transliterated word in Mesopotamia. So it could also have been A-L and other variations, but that means a gateway of the gods yep. or a stargate of the gods. So the thought is, is that they had the technology that they were putting into the pyramids, and we don't even know what the pyramids and the ziggurats and the towers were used for in the ancient world, but there's a lot of speculation that they were some sort of machines and things like that that could do mm -hmm. great things. And this is thought that they could go into another portal and free the Balim and or the parent gods from the abyss to come and be like yep. before the flood again, right? Mm -hmm. But that implies a, a portal as opposed to going out through the dome in the flat earth model. <clears throat> right. And... So, and the dome is thought to be something that's almost impenetrable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's have a look at that to see whether or not there's a correlation here. Is it a possibility or is the abyss located in a different place like the abyss than, than that? And, and, and this whole dome hard structure thing. So what we do know is, is that the word heaven has three different meanings. It's the Hebrew mm -hmm. word Shema, Shemaim is the, is, the, is the male plural, and it can also be used as angels, as the heavenly ones, right? And heaven is the abode of God and the angels. It's the spirit dimension. But there's also two other places in Bible, and as it's defined in Hebrew. One is the firmament. Mm -hmm which reaches as in, in, in the flat earth model as the dome um, and everything inside that dome. And what's outside of the dome is the rest of the universe. Now, inside the dome includes the sun inwards, however right. distant, far of a distance that is. But this firmament is made up of water. Yeah. Now, how, do, how do we know that? Because when God divided the waters, right? Um, mm -hmm. that's what creates the space underneath from the outer heaven to the inner heaven and is actually called the firmament is called heaven in Genesis one. So this yeah. is water, very much water like is on the earth, whether or not it becomes gaseous or something like that, or hard as ice perhaps, but it would have to be see-through ice, I guess, if it was this <laughs> hard surface. Um, but in whatever format that it's in, it's still classified as this urethra or this water that is separating the two universes. Yeah. So th that doesn't imply that it's impenetrable to me unless it does yeah. form into a solid that is absolutely transparent but there would be no there'd be no reason to penetrate that dome if you're trying to let them out of the abyss if the abyss is in the underworld which is in the earth and probably in another dimension right the, the only way that you would want to somehow sort of penetrate that if is if you go with the version that Azazel was hung in Orion and not into the abyss where the rest of the angels went to. Oh, and that this falling mm. star is Azazel that would fall to the earth to yeah. open up the abyss. Typically, the angels described in Revelation are loyal angels doing these things who has the key to the abyss. Right. And there's another angel in Revelation 20 that has a key. So there's a possibility of all of that, but now you're relying on polytheism. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not necessarily a fan house of built that. on sand. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's a possibility there, but I, I don't think it's trying to get through the dome. But I do agree with the part that they were probably trying to do something to bring the gods back from the abyss. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing about the Tower of Babel story that is always so hard to get across to non-believers or people who don't study the Bible who are or just non-Christians. You know, they look at it as the atheist perspective of the Tower of Babel story is God's keeping humanity down, mm -hmm. you yep. know, but like Nick and I were talking about it a while back, whether it was on the last live stream we did or maybe just around the campfire, that it really was a mercy. 
that God was bestowing upon yeah, us. They confused their languages. Yeah, to, yeah. to protect us from yeah. ourselves because he gave us uh, he gave, yeah. gave mankind their individualism back. Yeah, yeah a see, little bit and smash the empire in a way. Yeah. Be, because we have free choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and so very quickly, but because there's so much power that's centered, you brought an end time scenario about yeah. within a hundred years of the flood. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right on the heels of the last yeah. catastrophe. So yeah. confusing yeah. the languages wasn't to put you back into a non knowledgeable situation. It was to decentralize that power and that people would not be able yeah. to work together until, you know, the names of the Gentiles were fulfilled that are in the book of life created before um, creation, right? There needed yeah. to be that time to let things sort of unfold. And and the Redeemer needed to, to, to come in and save the world yes. um, from our free choice in terms of uh, forgiving our sins. Mm -hmm. But God is greater than free choice, right? So, I yeah. mean, he's Alpha Omega. He knows the beginning from the end. So, yeah, yeah there's this, this, you know, separation and confusion of the language was a blessing so that we could reach our destiny. Yeah, yeah. man, that's such a good point. Yeah. That's so true because it did. It, it paved the way. And it did decentralize us. And that's something that everything has been working back towards. Yeah. You know, is that is that that globo homo agenda, the, the homogenized globalization, yep. Yep. you know, of rebuilding Just that one, one world government, big one collective, world, yeah, with one thought, big, one language, one just, religion, yeah, one religion, one currency, you know, yep. and yep. Um, and it's like, man, we've been here before, you know, yep. and um, that's uh, yeah. That's always been the, the hard thing for me as someone who's into like a lot of weird stuff like that is, OK, I get the I get the flat earth model. Like I'm really tempted by that. You know? I get <laughs> sure. the whole like piercing the yeah. dome thing. But when you look at like Nephilim and you talk about this, when you look at like Nephilim technology, you know, the Atlantean myth, all that stuff, yeah. the Stargate angle of like yeah. rending the veil, it makes more seems sense. to be a little bit. It seems to have that ring of truth yeah. that striking yeah. that middle C yeah. a little bit. more. Yeah. Now, the one thing that. You could also look at the Babel thing to do is is in terms of what was trying to be done at Babel, he's an Antichrist type figure. And whether it's Antichrist or mm -hmm. any of the other Antichrist wannabes throughout history, they're always trying to do what Satan was trying to do, was to raise their throne into heaven. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. if they wanted to get into the spiritual dimension, they would, again, have to have a portal for that somehow, some way to do that and try and do what Satan was doing. And, and as Antichrist will do in the end time, he will actually, there will actually be this war in heaven as described in Revelation 12 and in Daniel 8, which is a corresponding prophecy, he will throw down some of the starry host. Yeah. yeah. And that assault into heaven. Yeah. Well, and that's something that Rob Skiba had talked about with um, uh, the Tower of Babel being an attempt, because it's in Jubilees and um, uh, one other book that I yeah. escapes me at the moment, but there is this discussion amongst the people building the tower that they're going to kill God and like, yeah. you know, kill all the angels yeah. and overthrow you know, yeah, and yeah. God saved them from that. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and there's the... no way you could build a tower high enough to do that. So there's right. something more um, yeah. to that. Yeah. So and that's what I that's what I think I despise the most about the original, you know, traditional interpretation of Babel that you, you know that they tell the kids and they mm. don't and they never the church never diverges from it. Like no, they were actually oh, just trying to reach a tower, literally to go all the way to heaven. Yeah. Because they were primitive, stupid. simple, yeah. stupid people. And they people. just wanted to be in heaven. Yeah. yeah. And but they, like, could, they, they could build something me. we couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, That's you how know, stupid it's, they were. This, well, and it's this whole idea like, <laughs> we started this slime, <laughs> you know? Yeah. We started a slime and we've evolved. Look how far we've evolved. Look at our technology. Look how far we've come. Yeah. You know, and I think it's the opposite. I think we've been devolving since Adam was kicked out of Eden. Oh, you know, yeah, right. uh, I think we were a lot. I, I, I think we're on a well entropy. Path. I mean, there is a case for entropy, you know, um, entropy of humanity. No. yeah, yeah, you that. know, everything degrades over time. And it's just a matter of whether or not you can reconstruct it or you can slow down the aging process, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. You know? And it's not that knowledge is neither good nor evil. It's right. how it's used that decides it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the trouble is, is the knowledge, 
without proper guidance and wisdom is always used for evil. Always, always. Um, you know, when we get you back, Gary, um, towards the end of the summer, hopefully, uh, I'd love to ask what your take on the Garden of Eden. And uh, we don't have time for it, obviously, today, because we've already dragged you out for a half hour longer than we were supposed to, uh, because Gary's such a gentleman. Yeah. Um, but I would like to talk to you about that, about the Garden of Eden, sure. the, you know, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yeah. yep. because that's another thing that like the atheists used to say, see, God's just keeping you down. It's like, no, there's probably more to it. than that, You know, yep. and I think there are a lot of stories that are like that. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Um, man, this has been awesome. This has been awesome, and you've been with us for a half an hour longer than you committed I know. to. Sorry. And I thank you. And we I almost got to all of our really questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We yeah. almost, man. We almost which made is it. Amazing, which is amazing. <laughs> but this has been great. Um, and I understand you're going to be taking a, a break for a couple months. Um, and I hope it's uh, still doing phone interviews. Correct. Yep. Still, still doing audio. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And still writing, right? Finishing the yep. uh, finishing the uh, sequel. Yeah. Yep. And uh, hope that goes well. And we look forward to. Uh, doing this again hopefully in the future yeah and uh, hopefully the world will still be spinning and and uh not completely <laughs> burned to the ground by then <laughs> we'll see <laughs> we'll see but i'm actually yeah. i actually am going to email you uh to get that document uh about uh yep i'll send uh, it oh, Putin. Putin. yeah, yeah. I'll send it yeah. To you. Yep. man that'd be great i, I yep. really really want to read that yeah yep. that'd be fantastic gary wayne we love you, buddy. This is always Thank awesome. We are so, so blessed to have you. Yeah. Author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. You can find it on Amazon, of course. You can order it through your local booksellers. Or you. we highly recommend you go to the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com and order a signed copy from Gary. If you have any questions about any information that he has, Gary, you're so generous with your time and your information. Um you're awesome. You're a national treasure, yep. and I'm so jealous that Canada <laughs> has you and not the U.S., you know. <laughs> and we hope you catch a big fish up there at yes. the cabin over the yes. summer. Uh, many, many I'll big catch fish. a few. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, have a good one, Gary. We'll talk to you later. Thank, Thank you. you again. Yep. Thanks, yeah, buddy. All right. Bye. See you.